This episode of Spectre Sound Studios is brought to you by Nail the Mix. Refine your mixing skills with world-class recording engineers for only $19.99 a month. Welcome to SMG Viewers Comments. Try and guess what number I'm thinking right now. 69, dudes! Yes, indeed. Welcome to episode number 69 of SMG Viewers Comments. Never, ever thought this series would get this far. Thank you so much for your support. You guys fucking rule. Let's get right to it. Can you explain what clocking is and how important it is for the small studio owner to have one? I'm finding mixed answers on rather or not this is necessarily a small studio and figured you could help me cut through the bullshit and make an informed decision. Love the channel. Okay, actually, it's no great mystery. Um, any digital device you're using to record has a digital clock, and that's all clocking is. Um, if you're using more than one digital device, you have to make sure they are all synced to the same clock, and that's why you see um, devices with word clock in and out. Uh, in my case, my master clock is my RME Fire, Fireface 800, and uh, that will go to my Aphex channel, and that will also go to my PreSonus um, 8 channel unit, and both those are slaved to the uh, to the RME. In this case, um, the the clock will go to the PreSonus unit, and then the output of the PreSonus clock will go to the word clock input on the back of the Aphex. Everything's synced the same way, and that's the thing. If you don't have your digital systems synced, uh, they won't sound good. Certain connections use uh, different clocking. If you're using a SP diff, um, the clock is internal actually. But again, it depends on where you're taking the clock from. I used to run an Apogee Rosetta back in the day. It was just a two-channel, super nice converter and whatnot. And I'd take a digital clock out of that to my M-Audio Delta 1010s, and I'd sync the uh, deltas off the Apogee. And I tried using the word clock, and that didn't sync. Because apparently, if you're using an SP diff signal, you need to take the clock off that as well. And uh, most clocks will sync up that way. So do your homework and make sure you know your connections um, before you start hooking stuff up. It really doesn't hurt to read the manual in this case. Hi Glenn, I work in an industry where we document our work so we know what we did later on. Now that I have done a lot of similar projects, I usually remember what I did. However, there are always differences. When you're recording bands, you take notes on different things that you did for future reference or you just do everything by feel at this point. You know, for the longest time, I always wrote down my amp settings. I've got a book with just page after page after page after page of 5150 settings. And that way I document what guitar sound got what. But yeah, again, at this point, I've been doing it so long. It's kind of just by, you know, dial in and away you go. But that's that's experience at this point. If you're starting out or you're midway through your career, it definitely doesn't hurt to take down settings, especially if you're using analog gear. You know, I know uh, when I was at Lacquer Channel Mastering, you know, those guys are top of the heap mastering guys, but even they've got, you know, black and white reverse pages where they'll write down all the settings they used on all the analog gear. I mean, that's the wonderful thing about digital. You can just pull a project up and see exactly uh, what you did on, on any given project. Just remind yourselves to back up every single project you do. I think that's a really good idea. I remember one of my very first projects, I actually said, nah, I don't need to back this up. And I always regretted it because we had some cool songs on there and I've always wanted to go back and go, oh, what did I do there? And I haven't been able to back your shit up. It, it will definitely pay off in the end. This one is for Glenn. Any legal stuff you need in place before recording a group? Other than the usual work delivery contract, like non-disclosure agreements, or does it depend on the band and how much of a stick-up they have up their arse? The thing you have to remember is when you're recording indie bands is a lot of people will talk shit, but nobody has any money for an actual lawsuit, okay? Unless you're dealing with major label acts with major label backing. You know, people can talk, oh, I'm going to sue you for this, I'm going to sue you for that. Nobody can afford that shit, so don't worry too much about it. That being said, you know, I usually do a handshake deal and lay down the ground rules beforehand. Like, one person's the money man, he gets the project when it's done. I was in the middle of a situation where um, a band had broken up and I had some guy tell me, oh, well, don't give the main guy the mixes. It's like, well, he fucking paid for them. Why are you guys getting me in this? Generally, let the bands know, okay, any internal politics you have, keep me the fuck out of it. What do you think of the new Metallica songs? Oh, I remember those guys. We haven't heard them in 20 years. I work as a live sound guy in a small venue, and earlier this fall, a band showed up without their bass. They asked if we had a bass laying around that they could use. They were only using it for one or two songs, so they weren't too picky. I said, not really. There is a bass, but it's a piece of crap, and the strings are like 10 years old. Their response to this was, that's fine. Our bass only has two strings, and they haven't been changed since 98. A part of me wanted to cry. And that, folks, is the sad reality of the music business these days. Bands are too lazy and just don't give a fuck. Bet you can't wait till they come to your studio to make an awesome record. Hey guys, just gonna take a quick minute here to talk about this week's sponsor, Nail the Mix. 
Now, I've been a big fan of Nail The Mix for quite some time, and I'm always proud to have them sponsor the show because I truly believe in what these guys do. It's an online recording school run by Joey Sturgis, Joel Wanasek, and Ale Levy. Each month, you get a set of multi-tracks to mix, the mixes are reviewed, and the person with the best mix wins something extremely cool. They also have a month-end video where one of the guys or a guest mixer mixes the song and takes you through it step by step. And I'll tell you, I have picked up a lot of great tips from this. So this month, they've got guest mixer Kane Churko, and the song will be Fear, Face Everything and Rise from Papa Roach. First prize for this month is a McDST Emerald Pack V6 and a one-year slate everything bundle. Second prize is McDSP Classic Pack V6. All right, back to the show. Question, sir. Have you ever had a metal band recorded with a high-end electronic drum kit or no other band that has? Love the channel. Actually, when I first started out, I had a top-of-the-line set of Roland V drums, and I kind of uh, worked my way over to acoustic drums. But um, high-end electronic kit, low-end electronic kit, it's the same bullshit. It still samples. It's still not real. It's still not really hearing the drummer, um, especially if you time align that shit after the fact. We're going to be reviewing the Samson 7 mic drum kit real soon, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, if you're a band on a budget, it's definitely something worth checking out. Hey Glenn, I have a question. On the topic of recording my electronic drums in, would it be better to plug it in directly to my computer or to get a Focusrite Scarlett? Not to make records, just want to use it as a writing tool. Well, that's the thing. I really don't know what you have for your computer right now. I mean, like, if it's your onboard sound card, uh, it might do the trick, but you're only going to get two inputs. I mean, like, uh, Focusrite Scarlett, you're going to have anywhere from two to four to eight inputs, and you'll be able to uh, have more control over your mixing if you uh, send the channels to your computer discreetly. So, yes, maybe. Again, I don't know what you're on. If you're just using onboard sound, the sound quality is probably not going to be the greatest. You might pick up a lot of interference noise, whereas, you know, something like Scarlett's going to have isolated circuits, so it's going to be a much cleaner signal. It really depends on what you want to spend and how much you want to experiment with After the Fact. If you just want to record two channels, you have to get your mix right on the way in. So it really depends on what you want to do. Generally, the, a good rule of thumb is you can't go wrong with buying a, a proper recording interface for your computer if you want to record things. Dude, love the channel, and I appreciate all the time and effort you put into these informative videos. I think something that might be cool to mention is the importance of protecting your ears. So many musicians, drummers, gig goers, etc. are completely unaware of the risks associated with exposing your fragile hearing system to high dB levels for long periods of time. Protect your ears, you dumb fucks! P.S. Grunge fucking sucks because even the bassist can play the entirety of Nirvana's life work on guitar. Oh, there's just so much right with that statement. Holy shit, man. Uh, you're absolutely correct about protecting your hearing. I never go to a gig or any, any live band performance without a pair of earplugs. Absolutely. I mean, like these days, especially in my mid 40s, it's absolutely critical to take care of my hearing because I don't want to be deaf in my 60s. You guys going to shows, absolutely bring hearing protection. Oh, well, you're a pussy. No, you're a fucking moron if you don't bring hearing protection. Absolutely. You're a fucking absolute stupid fucking retarded moron if you don't wear hearing protection. Don't take chances with this shit. I can't state that enough. Spend a couple minutes on Fail Army and watch these morons wipe out on their skateboards. Are they wearing helmets? Well, only pussies wear helmets. Yeah, the pussies who don't have the serious head injuries and concussions, they survive the falls. It's the same with your hearing. Take care of yourselves. I can't stress that enough. And yeah, grunge did suck. So wait, grunge ruined music with all those shitty hair metal bands in the 80s didn't? Oh, I wouldn't go that far. Grunge didn't ruin music. It ruined rock and roll, especially uh, from what the label started putting out because it just became shitty band after shitty band after shitty band getting signed. And don't, don't get me wrong, there were a lot of terrible fucking hair metal bands in the 80s, but there was also a lot of great metal being made. I mean, like you had the thrash explosion and there were tons of awesome thrash bands that got signed. And when grunge came along, that just ended and that really sucked. Hey Glenn, what is the best and worst band you have seen live? Oh, this is dead simple actually. Uh, best live show I ever saw was Judas Priest in 1988 at the Palace of Auburn Hills. The place had been open for like a week. Judas Priest was on the Ram It Down tour. Uh, definitely one of their weakest albums, but it was the best live show I've ever seen. They just came out and just annihilated on stage. They were fucking magnificent. I don't know what the hell, but they were definitely fire, firing on all cylinders. Best show I've ever seen. Second best show was Deep Purple. Same venue, actually. Worst live show I saw at the Pontiac Silverdome. Opening for the Rolling Stones, it was. Yep, you guessed it. The Spin Doctors. You guys remember that horrible pile of shit band? They were even worse live. That band sucked harder than Jenna Jameson and Swallowed too. Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, and Stone Temple Pilots ruined rock music? Well, it was worth it. 
Alice in Chains, not so much. They did get played to death, but uh, Pearl Jam, yeah, yep, that was definitely ruining rock music. And uh, Stone Temple Pilots, definitely. I uh, yeah, but I just, oh God, I remember going to see a show and it was this teenager band playing and I know, you know, and, oh God, this kid was fucking horrible. And every time I, I hear that song come on, that's all I hear is this kid fucking singing horribly out of key. And it's like, don't get me wrong. I mean, like, it's it's whatever you listen to at those formative years, you know. Uh, fortunately, when I was 14 years old, it was 1984, and music was fucking amazing. Then. Priest uh, had out Defenders of the Faith. Iron Maiden put out Power Slave. You know, Metallica was uh, just starting to happen. Ozzy had out... Um, you know, Ultimate Sin. There was all these fucking amazing records come out in the, you know, like from 84 to like 86. And um, it was just an amazing time for music. I know grunge music had a big surge in the early 90s. And if you were a teenager at that time, I'm sure it impacted your lives too. Um, it just, it was better at my age. Didn't think you would have disliked Spoon Man since it's pretty much a rock heavy metal song more than it is grunge. I think sound guys started shedding their grunge sound by the time they did Super Unknown. The thing is, you know, when the grunge thing first started happening, I kind of dug it, to be honest with you. I remember when Soundgarden came out with Loud Love. I thought that was a great song. I still like that. Why? Because it didn't get played to death on the radio. I love the Melvins. You know, I can put on Honey Bucket and crank the fuck out of that. That was just awesome. Again, it's it's. I blame radio more than the actual bands because the radio just played it to death. I mean, like, fuck, man. Outshine just fucking makes me want to vomit because it got played so much. Spoon Man makes me want to vomit because it got played so much. And again, I, I blame corporate America buying the rock stations and just, you know, taking the same 20 or 30 songs from all these Seattle bands and just playing them to death until you just wanted to fucking eat a bullet, man. <laughs> Worked for Kurt Cobain. Don't like grunge music, huh? Can we hear a fucking guitar solo? Have you never heard of the Meat Puppets? Oh, thanks. Thanks for bringing up the Meat Puppets. Yes, Blackwater. And when I wake up in the morning. That song makes me want to gouge my fucking eyeballs out with a fork, man. How, meat Puppets as an example of good music? Dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? Ah! Would be cool since now you have the focus right to combine it with like Samson Cheap 8 Mic Kit. Kind of a starting kit for drum recording and see how it sounds if done by professional like you. Well, thank you for that clear and concise statement that was really easy to read out loud. But uh, ask and you shall receive. I do have the Samson uh, mic kit. This is the DK707. We are going to be putting it through the focus right for a, an upcoming video. Um, and that's going to be the $1,500 recording studio challenge. And I'm talking complete software, mics, uh, effects, everything but the instruments for under 1500 bucks. So stay tuned. I'm sure you guys are going to uh, learn something really cool from that. Video on why preamps are important would be good, because I still don't know why I would need them, and I haven't been able to find any decent help with this. That's a great point. Um, a preamp is very important um, for signal clarity. As you build tracks one on top of the other, um, you're going to be adding noise. So the more tracks you add, the more noise you have. The cleaner the preamps, the less noise there's going to be. That's basically it in, in a nutshell. And the thing is, though, a lot of the preamps you get these days, like on the more inexpensive units, are actually quite good. Like the, the Mackie Onyx preamps, I know are excellent. And uh, those don't cost very much at all. But um, I'm going to do some shootouts, actually, coming up uh, between the expensive preamps and the cheap preamps. And... Uh, I'll let you guys make your own decision on what you think sounds good because um, there are some preamps out there that don't cost a lot of money that sound very good and have uh, definitely uh, raised a lot of eyebrows oh yeah i almost forgot i know you a lot of you guys are anime fans and i've been watching a bunch um i've been watching durara for like the last month and a half because it's just so many freaking episodes uh story's kind of interesting actually but I want to ask you guys, would you be interested in seeing a special dedicated episode of SMG Viewers Comments uh, to anime? Because I, like I said, I know a lot of you guys are fans and it would be really cool, uh, I think, to discuss some of your favorite shows and some of my favorite shows. So if you have uh, some comments on anime or some recommendations for shows I should be checking out, please leave a comment below and uh, we might do like a special Wednesday episode of that um, just to have a little fun with it. Your shirt offends me. For anybody who's curious, um, that was the Strat video where I was wearing the infamous rule number two. Your bass player is a useless cunt shirt. Well, hey, tell you what, pal. Um, you know, it's people like you that, that fucking whine about stupid shit like a t-shirt are the reason I made this shirt. Nobody cares that you're, that you're offended. That's absolutely true. Folks, seriously, you got to stop giving your kids trophies for participation. It grows them into whiny little bitches like that. Getting your shirt offends you. No one gives a fuck. You're offended, so what? Good! You needed to be offended! And in lieu of the fact that Donald Trump won the federal election, oh boy, is that going to make the next four years ever interesting, um, I've resurrected the Make Music Great Again t-shirt. You can find that online at the spectermedia.ca shop as well. 
All right, that's it for episode 69 of SMG Viewers Comments. Thanks, everybody, for signing up um, for not only the mailing list, but for subscribing to the channel as well. You guys have been amazing. I will see you next time. Sorry, I had to get that off my shaft. I fucking hate the meat puppets. <laughs> I actually own that CD. Oh! <laughs> Out! You're fired!